Here we're going to take a look at a ternary system that involves both eutectics and some solid solution. So the eutectic that we've looked at before, diopside and orthite, is plotted here on this uh, upper left edge of the triangle. Remember that the, if you go back and look at that video, uh, you might recall that the uh, eutectic temperature is at 1274 degrees centigrade, pure diopside melts at 1392, and pure northite melts at 1553. Well, what if you looked at the diopside uh, interacting not with an enerthite but with albite instead. Well, we would get a eutectic, although in this case the eutectic is at a much, much lower temperature, 1085. Uh, albite itself melts at a much lower temperature. And take a look at the eutectic. That liquid composition here is shifted very strongly to the albite side of the system. We haven't seen this in a binary diagram in the videos we've published so far. Uh, but in any case, it really doesn't matter. The, the, the diopside albite system uh, would work pretty much the same way as the diopside anorthite system, uh, just that the temperatures and compositions of the eutectic liquid uh, would be a little bit different. But we, if we take a look at albite and anorthite, there's no eutectic there. We've looked at that binary system. That is a solid solution. So we're looking at kind of an unusual, well, not necessarily unusual. We're looking at a system that combines two eutectics, uh, two binary, binary eutectics with a binary solid solution. So what happens if we throw solid solution into the mix? This is different than the ternary diagram where the all three of the binaries that were involved were all eutectic systems. So when we add solid solution, we get this kind of topology here. Uh, in this very nice diagram uh, from John Winter's textbook, uh, he is showing the uh, temperature uh, contours of temperature that indicate crystallization. We're going to look at crystallization, uh, two cases that are similar, but not precisely the same as what uh, John Winter discusses in his textbook. So you can work through that textbook to see a couple of other examples that are uh, just numerically a little bit different. So let's first take this guy here. Let's say we have a liquid. We'll look at the case of crystallization uh, in this system and a liquid that plots here pretty rich in diopside. The way I've plotted it, it is at, well, here's the 90% the contour for diopside. Uh, we're going to ignore the thermal contours now. We're just going to look at these tick marks that uh, can provide us uh, compositional contours. We look, it looks like it, we're at about the 70% contour, and then of the 30% uh, percent, um, remaining of uh, feldspar, uh, there's going to be some composition that is in between anorthite and albite, about evenly split. So what will happen if we take this liquid and cool it? Well, the way if it is at a very high temperature at, let's say, 1500 degrees centigrade, which isn't even plotted on here, then uh, if you think of this as a, any other kind of uh, topographic projection, then we're sitting way above the elevation, the surfaces shown by these curves here, 1350, 1300, et cetera. Changing the temperature does not change the composition. So it, having a temperature that is a, above, let's say 1400 or 1500 degrees C is not gonna change the position of this liquid here. However, uh, if we let it cool, we can think of this uh, white dot sitting above this contoured surface, but it'll intersect that surface at a certain temperature. And the way I've plotted it here is it's about halfway between the 1300 and 1350 contours. So it'll hit that surface at about 1325 degrees centigrade. And when it does, it will begin crystallizing diopside. It's not marked here, but we're on the diopside side of this cotectic shown in pink. So everything up here will crystallize diopside first. Everything down here, and we'll look at this later in another example, will crystallize plagioclase feldspar first. So if we crystallize diopside, we'll take this orange line over here. We'll move directly away from the diopside apex so we can draw a line that is uh, emanating from diopside through that point and the liquid will now begin to change. It's gonna move, it's gonna lose diopside components that'll force it to become more uh, enriched in the plagioclase components. And it eventually, once it hits this temperature here, once it hits this uh, pink cotectic curve, uh, it will begin precipitating a plagioclase feldspar. Now, of what composition and what temperature? Well, in terms of the temperature, here's the 1250 contour here that hits the cotectic 
and then doubles back and goes in this direction. So we're at a temperature below 1250. Here's the 1200 degree contour. It's not very finely contoured, so we're not going to get a very precise composition, but we'll call it about 1240 just for the sake of discussion. So at about 1240, that's the temperature at which the first plagioclase feldspar will precipitate. What will be the composition of that feldspar? Well, it's going to change depending on the temperature and the liquid composition, and that's what these dashed lines show. So we could follow this dashed line across. You can imagine an infinite number of these dashed lines that connect liquids with their equilibrium feldspar uh, compositions. They won't all necessarily be perfectly parallel to this guy. The liquid will precipitate out a crystal of plagioclase that is 80% anorthite. As it begins precipitating anorthite and diopside, it's going to move, the, the diopside's going to push it downwards, anorthite's going to push it upwards. The sum of those two vectors is going to move it along that pink line. So how far down this uh, pyroxene plus feldspar cotectic will we go? Well, we can pull this orange curve out and take a look at another line. This is a, well, a similar kind of line, but this one I've drawn, so it extends all the way across the diagram. If this is our bulk liquid composition here, then when we're done, we should make a mixture of diopside plus whatever's down here. So eventually we have to make a liquid that will precipitate out all bite and anorthite that has a solid solution mixture of about 50-50. So the final rock composition will be diopside plus something that has the composition of anorthite 50. Now what liquid will give us a, a, a feldspar of AN50? Well, we could follow this dashed curve here. Now we'd have to only be able to infer this from experiment. This is not a dashed curve that we can intuit just from inspection of the diagram alone. So again, you know, in a better diagram, we might have you know many more of these dashed curves going from this uh, close to this edge here down to the all bite corner. But in this case, we can follow that dashed line up. And so that would be our final liquid. Our final liquid would be here, rather rich in all bite composition. And that final last little bit of liquid that will crystallize will occur at 1200 degrees. So at 1200 degrees, the last little bit of liquid disappears. Uh, the plagioclase component as we go from this initial liquid here down to 1200 degrees has changed. Remember we said we've, the initial composition was over here at AN80. As the liquid migrates down that curve, then the plagioclase becomes more and more enriched in the sodium-rich or albite-rich uh, uh, component until it reaches 50% anorthite, and that's when the liquid is gone.